So part of the way to get around to not grow brush is grow better trees. So that's part of what we're going to cover here a little bit too. And whether it's retail, wholesale like we are. Uh, I think she's got a vase in front of it here somewhere. So green stored pallets like that, that's my stretch trap. We can bring them in. We can do uh, a lot of volume. And again, everything's handled mechanically as much as possible. And that's where the cold temperatures still always come in. So I went and looked. I don't have a, didn't have a video. I'll basically I currently I've never covered the picture. Uh, we have my son out there, basal pruning a tree, which we typically do our basal pruning. We start October 1st. I've done it as early as September 20th. Uh, needle retention with Fraser and cold storage is not a problem. We can palletize them like that one you saw, and they'll keep for three months, just like the day you cut them. You know, they, they flatten out a little bit in the pallets and fluff them out, make your greens, hang them up, and they'll fluff right back out to normal. You can't really tell the difference. The biggest issue with basic protein, that's the size tree for basic protein, which we call a six year in the field, six growing seasons. Um, it's labor intensive. There's no other way about it. It will be the pruning head to bedding. We have basic pruning heads that go on the bank. Yeah, now that they leave, they leave stubs. Yeah. All right. So when we harvest our trees, we use a brush cutter. And with a brush cutter, they got to be cut smooth or they won't work. So we have to have a handle to cut with a brush cutter. It simply doesn't work. So, with the greens are cut, we use electric grape pruners. Uh, at the moment, we're using Falcos. They seem to work the best at the moment. I've tried Falcos, Unlock, Unlocks, and two or three other brands. Uh, at the moment, they seem to make the best one. But we'll get branches up an inch, inch and a quarter diameter, and they'll cut them. But, uh, they're high maintenance units. I wish they'd last longer than they do. And they're like, is it battery power? Yeah. And we'll get a full eight hours out of the unit. Uh, really had much problem with it. The branches gathered up and packed like this. Of course, again, we're going to October. Just got it two days ago. Uh, we found as far as basic pruning sprayer. If you basically, we used to basically put it in the sun before we got it in the green spaces. Uh, and it would stop the tree. Fall in here, it would not, it would reduce growth by 25%. But when we basically prune in October, it doesn't affect the tree at all to grow as far as the following year. So that's made a difference. Well, we'll get two to three dollars per tree off the greens. So to me, it's a, net, it's a value added drop. We get, uh, in other words, 40 pounds per tree of grains. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what, cold time storage. Is, what time of the year do you start doing that? October 1st. Okay. Thank you. And then part of it's cold storage. So those greens are cut. They're packed in these pallets, like you see right here, in the field. So we only have to handle them physically once once we pick them up, palletize them. You can see the stuff, the branch sticking out. So we have one row on one side, one row on the other side. And you can actually see here, if you look, all these are one by four head on one side, across the top. Done and wrap rope around the tree. Then it comes into the building and we set it on the blacktop. Sprinkle the water 
12 hours. Yes. Overnight. Whatever come across in that day is water. Because foliage will pick up a lot of moisture through the needles. Just like a Christmas tree. Like we harvest Christmas trees, we lay them in a yard out in the sun, and then we water them from eight in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon every day, unless it's raining or snowing. And I can cut a tree the first of November, and it'll look just as fresh as the one you caught yesterday. So long-term storage is a matter of learning how to do it. We first started this all 15, 18 years ago, and we got, and one customer kept saying, I need greens, I need greens, this is, I don't have time to cut greens in the fall and the Christmas. So if you're willing to experiment with me, I'll cut them in October, put them in cold storage, so it should work, and that's how the greens business started. So the first few years we had issues with uh, it dry a little bit until we learned how. We would just throw just a piece of plastic over the pallet and run the wrap and stretch wrap. So we had a building stretch wrap machine where we could wrap a five foot stretch wrap around it and one over the top. And so once it come into the, the barn, we'd water for 12 hours, the following morning we stretch wrap around the top. All that moisture's locked in there. I don't know if you guys remember anything about the old deuteriums. They used to put in a little bowl of little plants in it, and the water would just continuously circulate. That's what basically happens. The water evaporates, goes up against the plastic, recondensates, runs down from the foliage. So it can sit in there for months and it doesn't dry. And I pulled stuff out of there left over in mid December, and it worked as good as they would cut it. Do you have any problems with fungus or mold? 35 degrees. That's the whole secret. You could store at colder temperatures than that. You know, I stored at 28. Uh, just curiosity what happened. And we stored them until uh, April. Then we made them raise up in April and they held right right into June and the sun burned them up. So, Long term storage is a matter of knowing how to do it and having facilities. But the thing that makes long term storage practical is cold storage. Without it, you're not eating, you're going to mildew. But me being a wholesaler, it allowed us to develop a greens business. So it's something we used to spend labor out, cut off, and throw it away. And now we cut it. We went from five year olds basically to six year olds because we get about 80% more foliage. Our tree statistically will gain about 80% in weight per year from the day we plant it to the day we harvest it. So it allows us to develop this market where we can sell 50 or 60 tons. How big is your refrigerated building? 10,000 square feet. It's basically used for uh, seedlings. That's what the storage is about. You know, we got, we can store in the spring a uh, million, million one trees in cold storage. So in the screens business, we're using less than half of it. So it all goes into the small cooler in the back to it feel solid and we move it out. The big cooler in the front will turn it on later in the season, especially when we get to making a lot of reeves. Like I said, we'll start making reeves. First week of October, so we can use a smaller crew to make a lot of rings. We don't have to have you know, four or five girls to make four or five thousand rings. And when they're ready for us, but when the custom comes in, a lot of our customers are our Christmas tree customers. So Christmas, you know, they buy X amount of Christmas trees, and they buy 50 or 100 rings, 200 rings, or whatever the number be. And we have certain people who buy a thousand plus rings. Uh, whatever they mix greens with Fraser, balsam, con color, arborvita, we do white pine, we do a lot of mixed greens, we use them. That just depends on their market what they want. And uh, we don't necessarily make the cheapest ring in the world, we try to make a high quality, 
So a 12 inch ring has got to weigh four to five pounds. So as the girls are making them, they check the weight once in a while to make sure we get that proper amount of rings. And a pallet like that typically produces around 80 rings per pallet. 80 12 inch rings, to rephrase that. That's the when, when, you, when you put the rings in those pallets, do you actually do you force them down or do you just let it naturally weight it down? Pretty much, pretty much weight it down. So we put the curve off the branch. Okay. And it comes down and the stub sticks out. We basically just keep laying it full to the top. And the same thing on the other side. And we'll go about that much over the sides. And then we'll just throw a rope over it, tie it down. Because we got to transport this out of the field. And we pick it up. We're using motor crackers in the field to carry the pallets. We have one. And we use the spring. Same thing we use the spring. We have forks in front of the loader track in front, and we have a rear set of forks on lift like we use the lumber yard and stuff. So we carry two pallets at a time. They go out and they just set up a truck and trailer and are brought in the barn. Do you do the same thing for con color? Yeah. Um, do you worry about the curve? I mean, con color needles being flat while they're in there? Technically, all of them will flatten some. But we find when you take them out and you shake them a little bit, they'll fluff right out. Okay, then you cut them. We saw the girl cut them. So we cut them out, make the ring, and when we hang it, you can see it's a naturally fluff right out when you hang on the rings. Because you know, a lot of times they're hang on the rings anywhere from about a week to three weeks, four weeks before they go to market. But the thing is, I see a lot of reviews coming from the West Coast, it's really dry. These things are fresh. They look just like you went out and cut it the day before and made it up in the ship. And that's the thing I like about it. It's high quality product, gets you a little better price for it. You know, we, when we first started this know, 15 years ago, we got the a good size order, first thing when we had a thousand, yeah. thousand rings. And then when they priced it, because we didn't know nothing about it, I, I, I told me totally when they priced it, I said, we can't do that ring for that price. So we just can't do it. it you know. So, but since we quoted price, we made the ring, so maybe we broke even on it. Uh, fall of the year, I just, you know, I looked at labor, what was costing us. We got to go with the price, so went up about three dollars a ring. And the person got that order. No one thing gets you there. You have, it. you have good soil, you're fortunate. I don't. We grow a heavy clays, so we do a lot of field prep. Genetics is a huge role in what your tree looks like. I've got a field. That we're going to harvest in this fall. This is the best, this is, to me, it's the best field of Christmas trees I've ever seen in North America. And I've been to Washington, Oregon, California, you know, all over the East Coast, Michigan, North Carolina, Canada. <coughs> it's a progeny test where we test all of our offspring, the genetics programs we do. We've got like 23 or 24 parents in it. I was doing valuation study in my last year. And I walked through, it's got about 3,500 trees. I found eight trees in the whole block, and this is number one ring. And that is why I'm talking. Not for me. So, we go on raised beds. Because that drainage is just so important. So, we'll take, we'll pile all the subsoil. Will incorporate a lot of nutrition pre plant. Most people, especially I know guys in North Carolina, feel you don't fertilize the tree the first couple of years. And I feel that's a mistake. First two years, the most critical time in the life cycle of the tree. You dug it out, it's lost 20 to 40 percent of the systems, digging operation, and done tremendous stress. You can all fertilize that young tree. 
tiling with your ground poorly drained makes a huge difference. I mean, how, well, how do you guys have good green soil? You're fortunate. But this particular field is going right here. When I started with this field, 20% of it would lay in three to four inches of water all summer. It's just like, it was just waterfalls everywhere. Today, through tiling, subsoiling, tiling machine we used for years, uh, we used for years. Right there, you can see the water coming out of the soil. Drain tile, think of a good drain tile. One is you got a good tile. You stop to buy a hole, the black stuff ain't work nothing, it doesn't work very well. And bury that tile on top so don't cover it out with wet. That will we go the thing basically clean full top so I'll scatter the clay on top. You know, if you need lime, you need fertilized, test your soil. We use our own recommendations. I no longer use the labs because I don't think they know what we're talking about, at least not the trees. And they might know for corn or soybeans, but phrases are a different beast. They require really go good phrases. They call it a lot of nutrition unless you're on really good soil. So here we're fertilizing, we've already lined pH is in Fraser. Anywhere between five and six. We like to start out near six, because in our case, pH is naturally going to drop over the growing cycle. A higher pH releases more nutrients, makes them a little more available to the tree. Fraser actually is their preferred pH for Fraser is five five. But you can grow them all the way down to four two. So we incorporate a lot of phosphorus, a lot of potash, three plants. So we'll put in, soil test comes in, we got 200 pounds of phosphorus, we're going to add it up to get up to 450. It's expensive, especially today's environment, with fertilizer, getting $1,000 a ton plus. Although I heard it's come down a little bit. I don't know whether that's true or not. But we got it from 950, but we bought it all in. Well, this is that. This is bag. We bought it in January. I put a new building up, so I had a place to store it this year. So that helped save me five thousand bucks, whatever the hell it was. But we go through 125 tons. Fertilizer here. So two years ago, my fertilizer bill was like forty-five thousand dollars. This year, it's going to be one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So it's greatly added to the cost of growing trees. A lot of times, when I figure on fertilizer, it's not what the tree needs; it's more what your wallet can afford. <laughs> So on these flat fields like this, we got a little depressions. We have to cut a ditch in. If you have to, these raised beds, you're gonna have an outlet for water. If there's a, a dip in the bed, it's just gonna fill up full water and act like a pond. You're never gonna be able to do nothing. For this particular field here, this is the first time we planted it. We made a mistake. Not getting good weed control before we started. An old cornfield was overgrown with a thistle and uh, bur uh, burdock. And we put beds there. And then there was the second mistake in our soil because we're heavy clay base. We put a plot plus one plus one from the warehouses where we have some plants grown by warehouses for us. And we're finding, we found out in our soils, we don't get any root penetration in our soils. So we've got this tree, it's been in three years, and we've got two roots come out of the side, and that's it. So what happens is the tree grows up, it doesn't grow any bottom. So that crop turned out into one of the worst crops I ever grew. 
It was just one of those crops you looked at and you go, I don't even think a picture of it looks like that. I don't want to show anybody, then I actually grew this thing. So then we harvested that crop, we redone that field. It's been in seven years now, I think. Sure. Mm -hmm. The ditches, cut the water off. That's what the bed system looks like. The power we make the bridge with. We have a 10 row system and a roadway. We use it for spraying. That feels pretty flat, a lot flatter than most of ours. There's a machine that actually forms the ridge as the deep plow goes through. That's the way we did it the last time. This is how we do it now. We have a lot of equipment. Uh, we can do up 24 acres in probably three days now. It used to take us six weeks. Uh, we've added one more step. This guy here, we we'll run the subsoiler here, right down the middle of the ridge underneath. These fields are all, we subsoil them, then we rip them, this big ripper, which we don't have a picture of. The first guy who does the subsoil underneath the ridge, the all for drainage. There's the bee plow working on the new tractor. Did you tile that field? Yeah. How we, deep is the tile? Actually, we're on three and a half feet. Okay. You will hook, hook it with the ripper or something. Huh? You will hook it with the ripper. No. So we, after we tile it, then we take and uh, subsoil, you know, we fill the tile, and then we subsoil at 90, approximately 90 degrees to the tile so for the fracking, because that fracks the soil out about a foot each side, increase the channels, the water works down, hits that top soil up on the tile and runs in. I've seen those tile lines run a four inch of water and shoot it 10 feet out if we get in a heavy rain. <laughs> you get a heavy rain, you know, two hours later, that tile is starting to run water. Oh, is it going to be laying there? So we make the ridges like this. Uh, once they're made up, <clears throat> And we come in and sow cover crops right away. You know, the old days we had issues with the erosion and stuff, but we learned how to control the herbicides much better. So, I think it's coming up here quick. All the level ground out in the roadway and all the ground. So we have neat fields, but this is a rock. In certain fields, we can't make really, really long ridges for the road becomes a problem. So we try to contain it to less more about 100 to 125 trees per row. Get this guy just fitting up the edge. And then we're going to sow cover crops on the whole thing. We'll hold it for winter. What do you use, Bumpy? Huh? What do you use? We use uh, in the trough, we sow a fescue. Uh -huh. We've gone to a tall fescue. Here's a guy sowing grass down the middle. You can see the grass coming out. We found if we sow the grass right after we make the ridge, it'll be a great germination. If it rains on at once, then the grass won't germinate. Uh, for whatever reason. Do you roll it after you seed it? No. No. Really? So, once it's seeded, so we can see the grass down the middle, then we actually sow winter wheat over the whole thing to hold it, to create a natural sod on there. Then once that's done and it gets about this tall, say six inches tall, the winter wheat can fall, we come in and spray 2,4-D. I don't know if you guys know what 2,4-D is, but it's a broadly herbicide, contact herbicide. So at least your grass grow if you kill a product. So these fields we get a lot of, we get a lot of red dock and uh, what we call yellow mustard and a few other weeds that we're probably going to work. What we find out is as far as weed control, if you get rid of the problem weed before you plant, it's much easier to keep everything under control. 
So that's been sprayed for two, four days till all the broadleaf weeds come in it. And then spray the top of the ridge with Roundup in fall. Uh, typically in the end of October. So then we come in by spray, we have that mat. Helps hold us from the erosion with the grass stuck up the middle. Makes a nice bend you plant in. So a few years ago we did a trial for Penn State on my ridges. And this is a, some pictures of planting that field without ridges and without tile. And a lot of them were uh, some of the or some of them came in, and a lot of them curl up and died anyhow. And that, that's a wet deal. That shows you what will happen. You can actually see the water laying there. That's how much rainfall we get. <clears throat> Raised beds, same trees. These weren't our trees. This Penn State brought their own trees. And their own genetics. They were horrible. <laughs> I mean, just, just horrible. I ended up harvesting about forty percent of it. It was really bad. I don't know where they got this stuff from, but I'm glad I'm not growing it. But you can see the survival difference. And they're side by side, you know, they're all a few rows apart. So, when we did that trial for Penn State, we had, uh, they wanted some tiled bed, uh, beds without green towel, flat ground, uh, some raised beds with tile, so they could do their test. And I think we end up losing about 40% of the crops that were on these beds. The ones with raised beds without tile, we didn't necessarily do with trees, but we grew really junky. I call them the trees. Whatever you want to call them. The other thing is genetics. We've got, especially in Fraser, that's predominantly what we grow. The one on the right, the, actually, it was a tree in my orchard. I don't know what. It's so ugly, I don't know why I ever put it in. That, that was the average tree. About 20% of them were worth anything. The tree on the left, the interior needles dropped off. I don't know what caused it. It's something physiological, weather patterns, and stuff. We were starting going, this is the whole thing in the project. That's what we're testing. Plants. But this needle drop uh, the interior we found was highly genetic related. So we had 30 parents across that field test. And you go one, there wouldn't be any trees in this row, they would drop the needle. In the next row, you have 10-15% of them do it. So we were able to breed out that trait as a genetic cross. And so that needle drop that we saw like that used to be one or two percent of the crop is almost totally gone on the second generation. We actually bred it out of the system so far. I know I really don't know what caused it. I sent samples in the labs, they don't know anything either. This is Field of Ohio. This is the these Canadian on the left, and on the bottom of the week on them. Any idea why they're weak? Nope. Weed control? Nope. It's deer in there. Nope. No deer in here at all. They're weak. They're weak because it's a plug plus one, plus one transplant. That's why the bottom's weak. Remember, I told you you weren't seeing the root systems on the one front? Yeah, so I was out of this far, but look at that. That's, you know what's wrong with these trees, don't you? I said, I mean, they grew good leaves. I said, there's no roots under them. I finally talked them into 
when it is shallower, dug one out. It'd been in two years and one had dug. It had two roots that had left that form because of the soil. Now, if you have a good loamy soil, it's not a problem. You know, these clay based soils that plug can have a serious problem with For a bare root plant, since it doesn't have to penetrate on the wall, it grows fine. And that's what we saw. I did a program years ago on the plug for transplant. We would get 68% new growth of woods in the first year, more than we had. The plug got almost nothing. In two years, we had hybrids off two and a half feet. The plug plus one only had a couple of woods on it because of our soil. You know, even in our soil, even if you take a petunia, you put it in your flower, that little pea pot, we can't get any roots out of this. It won't grow, but it, it's a soil thing. And that's why, if you're in heavier soils, you should, my opinion, you should be growing fine a very rough plant version of one. You can't take those plugs either and then try and bring them apart because they're so tight. That's right, they won't come apart. So, a certain species, we have more problems with plugs with true furs. On diamonds, we don't see much of a problem. Uh, Kind of we saw a problem. What else? I think there's another species that worked well with the plug. The big one is dogwood worked very well. And all scotch pine. Who is scotch pine? Here. I do do. Okay. I shouldn't say. They're a tough tree. Just to keep certain clients happy. Well, the thing that we've got scotch pine now is uh, there's a new needle cast in it. All black. Well, this thing just killed the place, right? I mean, it just all of them. In my area, they planted hundreds of thousands of Scotch pine back in the 50s, and they're all dying now. So it's hitting the Scotch and the Austrian. <clears throat> So that same field I grew that I got trees on, that's the exact same ground. With Schrager, one to the right, one shear, one to the left shear. One to the left, one to the left. light green, but that's just light. Picture. The only thing we changed on that, well, two things. One is the genetics. This particular tree, Fraser, the best genetic I've ever seen. We call it 241, but it tolerates wetter soil. Like we can grow nice tree in poor soil. The other thing we did, we changed the way we ripped the ground. We got a big ripper, which I don't know the picture of, but it has five chisels. They go down 16 inches, 12 inches wide. What it does, it sucks the top soil from the top. Bears it down so you end up with this underneath, creating more drainage in the plant. So, this field, what happened to we had that horrible thistle problem. We went in, and we ripped it up, let it grow up, spray it around up. We did it two years ago, probably went to the field five or six times, trying to control the thistle. And that works so so. What happened to it, that is the ripping process. We now create a much better drainage in the field. And we're getting that versus what we used to get. I, it's just more. You can even see that grenade on the right there. There's no body, there's no texture to it. And grenade are to a degree disorganized. Because we breed genetics, Fraser is much easier to work with than grenade. Overall, it was never as good as Fraser. So, what we gained, we'll gain two generations of Fraser, we'll take three generations of Canadian to get the same spot. Because Canadian, now you have to work with a disorganized foliage with needle retention issues. Some of the Canadian are very, very good, some of them are really bad. You do testing on uh, offspring now. I've had 
and aim third one, the offspring will drop. Mary, three dice. My other one's all virtually well spread. <laughs> so that one of the trees has a lot of work to be done on it. Fertilization. Uh, we do machine fertilizing. I think it works better by hand. The thing is, you need fertilizer out where the roots are. You know, a lot of people want to throw around the tree. That's really not where the tree roots are. That whole, I don't care whether you're a flat field or raised beds, that root spread system spreads out over the whole thing. You need to cover the whole thing with fertilizer. That was a nice shot. Let's use pocket with the drone. We map all our fields with drones today. It makes a nice shot. You can see how the fertilizer is being applied. And with that field being part of the cut, it really shows up. I thought it was a nice shot. And this is on a block of trees. That that's the third time that field been in trees. The first one is halfway decent. What time of year is that? We're fertilizing right there in uh, two weeks before bud break. Two weeks before bud break. Thank you. Uh, we fertilize Fraser twice a year. Once in the spring with high nitrogen, and again in the fall, between August 1st and 15th with high phosphorus. We like, we're using a 3011 11 in the spring and an 1846 L, which is DAP in the fall for applications. What's the spacing in the trees? Rows are six foot ten apart. That's just because the mesh of the tractor grows. At least enough space to get through for the spraying herbicide fertilizing program. Yeah. Um, Trees are five foot three inches apart. That spacing, you can do whatever you want. It, it makes no difference. You know, whatever. Some guys plant four and a half feet, four feet, six feet. Uh, we want a room that we can grow a basically a five foot tree, eight foot tall. Um, I'm working on trying to actually narrow the tree up a little bit. We're getting a lot of problems. Trees getting too wide because they're so vigorous today. So we're taking, uh, we're starting to shear the Fraser second year in the field, just hit the bottom and narrow them up. We can take almost a foot off width with that. Uh, you can grow a tree. And the other thing is, if the leader's 12 inches long, we're going to cut a tip at least. You grow 12 to 14 inches a year. We used to do a lot of 14 to 18, but it works if you've got really good soil, but a lot of soils isn't, so we pretty much settled down to 12 to 14, allows us to grow a little heavier, nicer tree, especially on the poor sites. Does it bother you fertilizing where there's no tree? And if you look at the economics, it's cheaper to waste of fertilizer yeah. than to spend the labor to do it. Right. You know, it comes down to economics. You know, that's the only time that happens. These are seven year olds. The field will be clear cut in the fall, so it's going to happen one time. So you're running a field two years or three? We harvest over two years. Two years. We started at seven. Mm -hmm. Something tells me <clears throat> my machine just died. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. In the meantime, I have some question. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me why you fertilize before bud break? The reason. If you fertilize in our area too early, especially with nitrogen, you will get so much rainfall, it will volatilize or leach away. You know, we get a tremendous amount of rainfall most year. Uh, being a drought this year is a rare event for us, but it's you know, occasionally happened. So then that's the main reason. So we get the main effect. If you fertilize a month before, we'll start losing some of our nitrogen. You know, like this year, we're dry, so we had lost nitrogen. Last year, rain 
every single day the entire summer. Yeah. So how do you predict what the weather's going to be? You know, you can use less fertilizer if you know what the weather's going to be. Like this year, I can drop my fertilizer consumption probably 30% just because it didn't rain. And we fertilize to the worst ground on the farm, not the best. And we get that tree where the, it's poor and it's not grown as well. We fertilize that heavy enough to get that one to grow. So on the good ground, it almost gets excessive growth. But because we change constantly across the farm, we don't have much choice. In my opinion. And just, if you look what a, a good number one's worth, number versus number two, for us it's 10 to 12 dollars a tree. But every time I can take a number two out, you know, I make a lot more money. If I can drop number two percent just by 10 percent, uh, a thousand trees, a hundred trees, uh, uh, a thousand bucks a acre. What, what kind of a soil remedial program do you have in mind for years to come? What kind of what? Soil, because your soil, if you're planting over and over and over again, you're depleting the soil. Well, you get a certain amount of erosion, obviously. So, Part of the thing is, once the trees have come out, we uh, rebuild soils, we grow cover crops for a couple of years, and just mow it down. And what cover crop are you using? We're using all use in a product called OT Teff, which is Teff mixed with orchard grass and timothy. Teff is a annual grass that grows extremely fast. Uh, so when you sow it, you get a cover crop very quickly. Probably erosion because we're always sowing our crops in June and July, right in the middle of thunderstorm season. Uh, and that's worked well. We used to use clover and Timothy. <coughs> then we found out there's a second root rod around the sides of my copper. And that root disease on the off season this is on clover roots. So we were actually feeding the disease within the farm. So we found a way we don't use clover anymore. We've gone to this, what they call OTTF. We used to sow clover of Timothy and we had to throw oats in it to get a good cover so it germinated quick, stopped erosion. Now with this TEF germinating, typically it's got to rain in two days, two and a half days it's out. Now is that spelled T E F? F. Tef is T E F F. You go and ask for O T T F, which would be the orchard grass, Timothy, and uh, Tef mixed with it. So they, they mix it and we sow, I think it's around 20, 22 pounds the acre. Uh, it has to be drilled. Tef won't germinate unless it's drilled into the grain drill. I've tried broadcasting service and it just doesn't come up at all. 